Thank you. The final item of business uh, is a member's business debate on motion 11662 in the name of Douglas Lumsden on declaration to triple nuclear energy launched at COP28. This debate will be concluded without any questions being put and I would ask those members who would wish to speak in the debate to please press the request to speak buttons and with that I call on Douglas Lumsden to open the debate. Mr Lumsden. Sorry, President Officer, and thank you, President Officer, and thank you to the members who signed my motion allowing us to debate this tonight. And the purpose of this debate is a simple one, to bring Scotland into line with the majority of countries in Europe and the rest of the Western world in recognising that nuclear power is a key component of a modern, zero-carbon, sustainable energy provision. At present, Scotland's anti-science SNP government has shut the door to consider this green, sustainable and reliable form of energy. And we are losing out to our European and Scandinavian partners, and we are at risk becoming over-reliant on fossil fuels to supply our base energy levels. Quite simply, President Officer, we are falling behind the rest of the world in an area that we, we have the skills and the potential to be leaders. And why? Because this SNP, so-called Green Government, refused to accept the science behind this technology. Instead, listening to anti-science rhetoric on this vital component of a green energy jigsaw. At COP28, a declaration to triple nuclear energy was signed by many countries who see and understand the potential of nuclear to provide clean, sustainable energy as part of the move to net zero. The declaration understands the importance of the application of nuclear science and technology to continue contributing to the monitoring of climate change and the tackling of its impact. Its emphasis, the work of the International Atomic Energy Agency, and recognizes, recognizes that nuclear is already the second largest source of clean baseload power. The agency demonstrates that nuclear energy will more than double before 2050 and also recognises by increasing nuclear we will reach our net zero targets quicker and it's less costly. The declaration was signed by 22 countries and demonstrates the international recognition of the importance of nuclear as part of the picture of our journey towards net zero. Of course. Martin Whitfield. I'm very grateful. Um, to Mr Lumsden to give way and isn't that right because the provision of nuclear power gives us both grid stability and security that is non-weather dependent that's essential for going forward particularly with regard to the security and the grid stability that we need here across the UK. Dr Lumsden. I, th I thank Mr Whitfield for that intervention and he is absolutely spot on it's part of the energy mix that is required to provide that energy security that we need and indeed many countries feel that this picture is incomplete without nuclear and that jigsaw will have a gaping hole if nuclear is not included as a key part of providing for our energy needs in a carbon-free world. Yes, sir. will. Craig Coy. I thank uh, Douglas Lumsden for giving way. Does he share my concern that on a debate as important as our energy future and our energy security, there is not one single member of the Green Party in this chamber willing to come forward and debate it? Douglas Lumsden. I think Mr Hoy makes a, a very good point there. I was expecting to see some of them in the chamber, but uh, obviously they don't want to make an argument against nuclear. I will, Mr Hoy. Mr Hoy. I do think a rational approach should be taken here to energy policy because it's too serious to do anything else. But are there not three risks at least of, of nuclear? One, that the costs of uh, Hinkley Point, of uh, one in um, Finland, or Kulioto, and the third one of EDF, have massively overrun. Secondly, the decommissioning costs are really unquantifiable, as we've seen at Dunre, and indeed the costs are still with us today and providing employment, I suppose. And third, that, and I hesitate to say this, but we look at Nord Stream, that nuclear power stations are particularly prone to terrorist attack in future, and this is something which uh, is, is something we need to consider. Douglas Lumsden. Uh, I thank Mr Hume for that uh, intervention. In terms of uh, energy security, it's much better that it's um, built uh, in this country. And in terms of costs for Hinkley Point, yes, it has increased, but so has the cost for, for all our energy, including, including wind. We've seen that 
move considerably in the CFD allocation round six. And in the short time I have this meeting, I'll address some of those points more. And I want to set out the case for nuclear in terms of energy security, green credentials and economic viability. President officer, the war in Ukraine has revealed an over-reliance on Russian oil and gas in many European states. Countries without a base load of nuclear power, like Germany, have found themselves in economic hardship due to the fact that they do not produce enough power domestically and even turned to coal. We must ensure that in Scotland we do not fall into the same trap and provide energy domestically rather than import from other countries. So while in Scotland we do have a, a good wind generation, nobody can deny that, but it's weather dependent and does not provide the base load that is required day to day for our communities. At present, onshore wind provides 10.8% of our UK energy mix, while nuclear provides 14.7%. Wind is unreliable and dependent on being able to transport the energy from the turbines to where it is needed. To ensure grid stability and security, we require a form of energy that can supply a reliable base load 24-7, which nuclear does. It complements renewable generation, but is required to supply that base load within the system. By utilising nuclear energy, we were able to cut gas imports by 9 billion cubic metres in 2022, thereby reducing our exposure to international gas markets. Nuclear makes sense in terms of energy security and is the only answer to ensuring that we can meet our base load requirements in a non-carbon way. Nuclear is a green form of energy. According to the UN, it has the lowest life cycle, life cycle of carbon intensity, the lowest land use and impact on ecosystems, and the lowest mineral and metal use. And it's also the only form of energy that is required to track, manage, and make safe its own waste, and does so very successfully and safely. And I should have mentioned that price is built in to the initial cost. Nuclear energy is heavily regulated, has extremely high safety standards and is well respected within the energy sector. To go against this is simply hyperbole made up by the green wine bar elites who prefer to use pseudoscience that rather than the real science to back up their claims. Torness Nuclear Power Station has the capacity to power 2.2 million homes from one tenth of a square of mile of land rather different from our onshore and offshore wind farms. But soon Torness, like Hunterston before it, will soon be turned off. And with it, the future of many of our young workers who have not had the opportunity to work in the nuclear industry, unless, of course, the upsticks are moved down south where the government does not have a blinkered view of the world. And that was something I remember from the nuclear industry reception, hosted by my colleague Liam Kerr a couple of months ago. A young apprentice from EDF, I can't remember his name gave an inspirational speech on his career with EDF but was now looking to move away from Scotland to continue his career. Highly skilled, bright workforce of the future lost to Scotland. And presiding officer, nuclear energy is produced where it's needed rather than in our precious rural countryside. On Friday this week I'm attending a meeting of a local community council who are very worried about the impact of pylons and substations of their local community, built to transport the energy from wind farms to where it's needed in the central belt. The impact of these pylons... Oh, briefly. Uh, Minister Julie would, he, would he accept that uh, power generated by nuclear also has to be transmitted? Dr Slums? Uh, absolutely, but I think the Minister misses the point. It's actually produced near where it's needed, and that's why you have less distribution and less pylons needed across the country. And the impact of these pylons on our scenery of Scotland cannot be underestimated and communities are rightly concerned about their impact on tourism and therefore economic development, as well as the distribution to ecosystems during their construction. Finally, President Officer, I'd like to address the economic case for nuclear energy in Scotland. Wind energy has many hidden costs, such as transportation of energy, decommissioning costs of turbines, costs that are included up front in the construction of nuclear power stations. Nuclear does, have to be the most, does not have to be the most expensive option when done properly and at scale. 
In Scotland, the nuclear sector provides 3,664 jobs, 400 million GVA, and significantly almost 25 per cent direct employment occurs in the most deprived 10 per cent of local authorities. Nuclear has a key role to play in the energy future of Scotland. To ignore it and use false arguments against it, anti-scientific. This government, that apparently has superior green credentials, are badly letting down the people of Scotland by not investing in this vital technology that could provide clean, green, sustainable energy for years to come. The position taken by this government is badly letting down our communities. It's anti-science, based on false claims, founded on fear and completely nonsensical. It lets down our energy industry, our communities and badly affects our standing with our neighbours. I call on this government to join with countries such as the USA, Canada, France, Netherlands, Sweden, Finland, Poland, Ukraine, Czech, Slovakia, Hungary, Romania and many others in welcoming nuclear as part of the energy mix, an essential piece of the jigsaw in reaching net zero. Thank you, President. Thank you, Mr Lumsden. I now call Jackie Dunbar to be followed by Graeme Simpson. Ms Dunbar. Thank you, President Officer. Before I start, I would like to refer members to my register of interest, uh, as I was a former councillor of Aberdeen City Council. As is traditional to do so, I would like to congratulate Douglas Lumsden on securing this debate this evening. The timing of his submitting this motion ties in not just with what was happening in Dubai on the global stage of COP28, but also what was happening in our old stomping ground of Aberdeen City Council. The same day that COP28 came to a close, Aberdeen City Council was due to discuss a petition calling for it to join nuclear-free local authorities, whose members aim to tackle in practical ways and within their powers the problems caused by civil and military nuclear hazards. I understand from my former colleagues that the petitioners, when they finally spoke to councillors earlier this month, gave a very impressive presentation where they spoke of how renewable energy generation is both cheaper and doesn't leave future generations having to deal with the nuclear waste left behind. And during a cost of living crisis, which has been driven in part by high energy prices, I think it is particularly important that we consider how much it costs to generate energy, especially if there is a risk of that being passed on to the consumers. As uh, I'm no, opposite, no male opposition took an intervention from any of the females on this side yesterday, so I'm going to not give way to any male uh, MSPs tonight. Um, if we can't get intervene on, on the gentleman, then I'm not going to take one from you. Um, and during a cost of living crisis, which has been driven in part, as I said, by high energy prices, I think it's particularly important that we consider how much it costs to generate energy especially, as I said, if there is a risk of that being passed on to consumers. As things stand, I understand that nuclear costs £92.50 per megawatt hour, whereas offshore wind is £37.65 per megawatt hour. The major driver of that higher price is the upfront costs of, construction, of constructing the power stations. I think that ties into the Scottish Government's position whereby they are supportive of extending the operating lifespan of Torness, provided that strict environmental and safety criteria continue to be met, but are not supportive of the building of new nuclear fission power stations in Scotland under current technologies. And that cost remains high, too high, I believe, despite significant investment by the UK government. Meanwhile, greener renewable technologies are not getting anywhere near the same level of financial support. Pumped storage hydro is an example that I know the Minister has spoken of before, which is able to plug gaps in the intermittent supply that can result from other forms of renewable generation. Douglas Lumsden and I have the great privilege, as, as same as Audrey Nicholl, who is in the chamber tonight, to represent Aberdeen, which is, and I will keep saying this, the future net zero capital of the world. Alongside the hugely skilled workforce we have, which I maintain as our biggest asset, across and around Scotland, we also have an abundance of renewable energy sources. The motion we are discussing today states that nuclear technologies can be located where they are needed, 
So let me, just before I finish, pose an open question. In a Scotland which has much potential to generate wind, wave, tidal and hydro energy as we have, where exactly do they think should, should be fully considered for hosting new nuclear plants going forward? I know that the motion mentions industrial zones, the, but the I want to hear place remarks. names in which part of Scotland, in which... I'll take an intervention from Mr Hoy because he's chundering from the sidelines as usual. Craig Hoy, briefly. The, 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 the member asked for a place and location. Could I say Torness near Dunbar in East Lothian? Shackleton Bar. Mayor, presiding officer, um, unless he, in case he didn't realise what I was meaning, I meant the new places where they were going to go, because Mr Lumsden had decided that they should be near the places where, it is, where they are going to serve. Um, so... Moving to my conclusion, there may be a role for nuclear in Scotland at some point in the future, but at present the cost of new power stations runs into billions of pounds, takes years to construct and looks set to cost around three times as much per unit as can be achieved from renewable sources. So as we look to tomorrow, I firmly believe that our focus should remain on clean, green and cheap renewable energy. Thank you, President Officer. Thank you, Mr Barr. I now call Graeme Simpson, who's joining us remotely, to be followed by Martin Whitfield. Mr Simpson. Well, thank you very much indeed. It's been uh, interesting to listen to this debate so far. Uh, and can I um, congratulate my colleague Douglas Slumson for securing the debate in the first place? And I would just say to uh, Jackie Dunbar, um, she asks where new nuclear should be cited. Well, it can't be cited anywhere currently because the SNP is blocking it uh, under under planning rules. So, you know, if you want to remove the, those planning restrictions, then you may see um, applications coming forward. Now, Douglas Slumson uh, is absolutely right to point out that the the main point of all this is uh, energy security. And, you know, I would have thought members across the chamber, and by the way, I share Douglas Slumson's disappointment that there are no Greens taking part in this debate. I would have thought that members across the chamber um, would uh, recognise the need for Scotland uh, and the rest of the UK to be energy secure, particularly in light uh, of the conflict uh, in the Ukraine. You know, surely we don't want to be held to ransom for our energy by uh, despots like v Vladimir Putin. Um, we need to have a mix of energy. We need to have uh, wind farms. Um, you know, we need, you know, I, I think there's a, a role for hydro as well. Um, but we have to accept that the wind doesn't blow all the time. Uh, and there is a, a need to cover that base load. And that's why nuclear has a role. I was delighted um, when the UK government announced that it would be setting up uh, Great British Nuclear uh, to herald uh, the um, introduction of small uh, modular reactors. And I can tell uh, members, if they don't know already, that these, uh, these reactors uh, don't have to be built on site. They can be built uh, in factories uh, and then transferred uh, to to their ultimate locations. Now, I think this is a, a, a great development. Um, it's good for the economy. It's good for jobs. It's good for skills. And there's an ambition um, by the UK government. I wish the Scottish government would get on board with this to have a quarter of our energy provided by nuclear by 2050. Um, I'd like to Scotland to be part of that. Um, what does nuclear provide? Well, it provides that energy security that I spoke about. Countries that phase out nuclear, Germany is a good example, become critically dependent on natural gas generation to guarantee security of supply. It, it provides that grid stability and, and security and requires a non-weather dependent 24-7 base load. It also provides green energy, Deputy Presiding Officer. It's as green as renewables. According to the UN, uh, nuclear has the lowest uh, 
life, start, life cycle carbon intensity, the lowest land use and impact on ecosystems, the lowest mineral and metal use. You'd have thought that members of the Green Party would welcome that. And of course, there's an economic case for nuclear as well. Douglas Lumsden spoke about uh, skills. We both at, uh, attended that uh, meeting in Parliament where we heard the powerful presentation from a young apprentice who may well have to leave Scotland um, if we end up with no nuclear industry here. That would be a crying shame. Presiding officer, Scotland needs nuclear. Uh, and I thank Douglas Lumsden once again. Thank you. Thank you, Mr Simpson. I now call Martin Whitfield to be followed by Liam Kerr. Mr Whitfield. I'm very grateful, Deputy Presiding Officer, and it is a pleasure to contribute to this debate, which allows me, of course, to talk about Torness and East Lothian in the south of Scotland. Um, but I want to start by thanking Douglas Lumsden for bringing it. At a time when we are entering a period where debates about nuclear energy have to take place, and they are taking place across the United Kingdom, but unfortunately, here in Scotland, we seem to have um, a government that's closed its eyes to the future. And that's important because Torness is the last remaining nuclear power generation station in Scotland. And to answer Jackie Dunbar's question about where a new site should be, of course, the obvious site is where Torness B was designed to be, right next door. So that with the use of a nuclear reactor, the very same generation hall um, can be used to produce electricity and ongoing. And it has been announced and is in the public domain that 2028 could possibly be the last year of generation for Torness, which means that Scotland will lose all of its production capacity for, as we've already heard, maintaining the grid. Um, I'm more than happy to. Paul Sweeney. <clears throat> thank my friend for giving way. Uh, Mr Sweeney, you would need to put your card in, please. Thank you. Could we have Mr, S Mr. Sweeney? Paul, apologies, Deputy Sign Officer. Uh, thank my friend for giving way on that important point. He raises the issue about capital costs, of course. One of the huge capital costs of building a nuclear power station is the turbine hall, which already exists and can continue operating for many decades to come at Torness. So plugging on some new modular reactors to that turbine hall would massively reduce the capital cost of a new nuclear station, would it not? Barney Whitfield. I, I'm very grateful for that intervention, and, and, and my friend is, of course, right. And it's worth taking a moment to pause to discuss the aspects, because we frequently hear about the high cost of um, nuclear power generation. But, of course, it is the only energy production where the consequences at the end of the life of the nuclear power station are taken into account. And, in and indeed, only um, on the 19th of February, um, the Scottish Government published its pa paper on the challenging, um, challenges that face offshore wind decommissioning and the fact that the Scottish Government are unable to give a period of time when the Scottish Government will conclude its analysis on what it's going to do at the end of the generation period, particularly with regard to the wind turbine blades, um, which are themselves an intricate engineering um, marvel, but not easily recycled, not easily repurposed. And the cost and the charge that has gone to the production of the wind, through the, wind, uh, the energy through the wind turbine, is not included in those costs. I'm happy to give away to point out to Martin Whitfield, I'm sure you'll be aware of the onshore wind uh, sector deal, where part of that deal is including a blade remanufacturing site uh, as part of that deal. They're actually imminently recyclable. Martin Whitfield? Well, well as I've spoken to a, a, a number of the, the, the onshore um, turbine manufacturers, and, and you know, there are a significant number of primary schools that already have beautiful rain shelters for their bicycles from the former turbine blade. But I do recognise that it's a challenge, and I hope the government recognises that it's a challenge, because it also puts to base this argument that nuclear power is so expensive. It's expensive because it's taking into account the whole life cycle and beyond of the production of green technology. And I want to take time in the short time that I have, Deputy Presiding Officer, and I won't, I won't press you, that Torness um, last year generated eight terawatts of low-carbon electricity. And we can bandy around figures, which is done quite a lot, particularly in debates, but I also want to talk about the nearly 700 people who work there. And not just the apprentices that we've heard who are so skilled. Um, 
If it's uh, short, very Mr. brief Hoy. intervention, Mr. Hoy. Uh, thank you. Uh, he may be coming to this point, but could I just uh, ask Mr. Whitfield? Uh, he will have met Matthew French, I believe, as well, the talented uh, employee at Torness Power Station, who was Apprentice of the Year. He warned when he was in this Parliament he wants to continue working in nuclear and he wants to continue working in Scotland. Wouldn't it be deeply regrettable if we lost talent like that from Scotland? Martin Whitfield. I'm, I'm very grateful for that intervention, but it's, called, it's not just Matthew. It's all the families that rely on the income from that. It's over 8,000 people who, during shutdown, come to ensure the safety of the nuclear power station site. It's all of the small businesses and small medium businesses that rely on that income, over £10 million coming into East Lothian alone. And the fact remains that to take a simple ideological stance against an energy source that will be needed to maintain the grid, to ensure our security, I, with the greatest respect to the Scottish Government, feel is short-sighted and it is wrong. And we need to readdress this point and they will find support not to harbour and to shout out U-turn, but actually to support the nuclear power industry going forward, in particular for the apprentices, for the employees, for the families, for East Lothian, for Scotland and for the UK. I'm grateful, Deputy Presiding Officer. Thank you, Mr Whitfield. I call Liam Kerr to be followed by Fergus Ewing. Mr Kerr. Yeah, thank you, Presiding Officer. I'm really pleased that Douglas Lomson's called this debate today, but I'm actually particularly pleased to see this minister responding, because I'm confident from my previous dealings with her that she will take a more thoughtful approach than her predecessors. You see, almost exactly two years ago, I contributed to a debate on nuclear and dealt with all the government's then objections and some that we've heard today, such as the economic argument, which I tried to help Jackie Dunbar with earlier on with her misunderstanding. You see, at the time, the price of power from Hunston B until it was retired and from Torness was about 45 pound per megawatt hour. Meanwhile, data suggests that the average price of 16 operational wind contracts for difference in Scotland is £82 per megawatt hour. And I'm pleased to inform Jackie Dunbar that the current offshore wind strike price is actually £73 per megawatt hour, not the way out of date figure that she offered. And, President Officer, on the build cost, the Scottish Government at the time kept referring to Hinkley. But while the smaller, cheaper SMRs are the preferred model that we would use in Scotland, in any event, the actual construction and operating cost of Hinkley Point is only £30.50 out of the £92.50 strike price. The other two-thirds is the cost of borrowing money. And interestingly, the National Audit Office said that the UK government's regulated asset-based model might reduce the cost of Hinkley by about 40%. And furthermore, with wind, decommissioning costs are not included, unlike with nuclear, and constraint payments to compensate wind farm operators for curtailing their generation when supply exceeds demand cost £380 million in 2022. That's roughly £11 per megawatt hour. Now, the government has also historically pointed to nuclear being high risk in terms of safety, but touch wood, there have been no major nuclear safety incidents in the UK industries nearly 50 years. And anyone who's done their homework knows that all current operating stations have extraordinary levels of built-in redundancy whilst being subject to one of the most robust regulatory regimes in the world. The Minister's predecessors also worried about the waste, but seemed unaware that the nuclear industry is the only one to track manage, make safe, and crucially, pay for its own waste. Indeed, I recall that EDF and the UK government have set aside some £15 billion to decommission existing power stations and dispose of waste for them. And in any event, the amount of waste that is produced by nuclear is very small. Almost all the radioactivity is found in a tiny fraction called high-level waste, which is robustly dealt with. But the final point, President Officer, it's about what we do if we don't have nuclear in Scotland. I will. Paul Sweeney. Does the member also recognise that modern evolutions of fourth and fifth generation nuclear reactor designs actually consume nuclear waste as energy, thus creating a closed waste loop? Liam Kerr. Absolutely. It's a fantastic point from, from Paul Sweeney. And uh, moving on to what we do if we don't embrace that technology, if we don't move forward with nuclear. You see, to pick up, actually, Martin Whitfield's well-made intervention earlier, wind turbines tend to operate at about 25 to 40% of the time against nuclear, which operates just over 90% of the time. Without nuclear power, 
when wind turbines are not operating or solar is not producing, the grid would have to use sources like gas. And it is notable, the point was raised about energy security several times, it was notable that nuclear cut our gas imports by 9 billion cubic metres in 2022. <coughs> and this is key. You see, I asked the then minister in 2022 the following question. According to the Climate Change Committee's net zero report, to hit net zero, the UK will need four times more clean power by 2050. They further say 38% of that needs to be firm power, in other words, baseload. I asked him, from what source will Scotland get that 38% firm electricity generation? Now, of course, he never answered the question. And nobody, nobody can answer that question or has done since. So, President Officer, I'm really looking forward to listening to the Minister respond on this because I'm confident that in closing she will eschew the approach of our predecessors and not make false comparisons, not question the safety of the technology and the waste issue, but above all will answer the question, if baseload is not to be generated in Scotland by nuclear, from where will the government generate it? Because the facts I set out do not mean we shouldn't build wind. They mean we shouldn't try to do this with wind alone. We should follow the advice of expert modelling organisations such as the Climate Change Committee, the OECD, the UN, the International Agency, Energy Agency, MIT, Imperial College, the Energy Systems Catapult, and build both nuclear and wind and everything else in Scotland to build a strong, secure, resilient, net zero economy. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you, Mr Kerr. I now call Fergus Ewing to be followed by Craig Coy. Mr Ewing. Um, thank you, uh, Presiding Officer. I had the privilege of being the Energy Minister for, four, for, for um, four years, from 2011 to 2015, and that allowed me to meet and learn from some of the experts in Scotland and the UK, some of, some of those that Mr Kerr has, has just mentioned. Uh, and uh, what struck me was that to have a functioning electricity system you need to have a variety of different provisions of electricity because each have pluses and minuses. And there's a difference between electricity and most goods and services. I mean, you know, I happen to like Mars bars, Maseratis, and Mac Macon Rouge wine, but I could live without them. And if there was a shortage in the supermarket or the car showroom, it wouldn't matter one jot. But in electricity, you need to generate enough electricity to keep the lights on, keep the factories going and if you don't you've got a very serious problem as Germany has discovered with much of its industry having had to shut down. So the, the maxim that applies here best is Winston Churchill who said that when it comes to electricity supply the solution is variety and variety alone and the question is what is that variety? Now I'm agnostic on future new nuclear power um, when I was minister, the, the, the government modulated its position to support the operation continued of Torness and Hunterston, which was welcome. Uh, but I'm agnostic now because the technology has driven forward, but so has the technology of advanced gas turbines. That's improved massively in the past 20 years, and I'm no expert in any of this, I have to say. But I think that baseload and backup will be an essential feature of an electricity grid system. It cannot be entirely stochastic. And although the risks of wind power are less pronounced than some argue because of the way in which the, operation, the, the uh, electricity system is operated, as I learned when I visited National Grid in, in Warwick some years ago, it's actually more reliable because you can predict within 24 hours where the wind is going to blow. And floating offshore wind, uh, as Fred Olson told me over breakfast in Orkney, is, is advantageous for Scotland because... Uh, our waters are deeper and fixed, fixed platforms are more expensive and therefore floating platforms allow us the opportunity to station the wind farms where the wind is blowing in a different direction and therefore make more money and generate more electricity. But that's, that's perhaps a um, herring. I mean, to take the, the point that uh, Douglas Lumsden, I think, fairly asked, if, if not nuclear, where do we get the back, the back load, uh, the, the, the base load to back up from? I do think that advanced gas turbines should be considered because they've improved so massively, they can be built very quickly, the technology is established and clear, 
unlike some of the smaller nuclear power stations, where I'm not quite sure that the technology has been fully developed. It may be, it may not. I'm, I'm not. To... Yes, certainly. Dr Slumson? I'd just like to ask, does he think that the government's partners, the Green parties, would support him in advocating new gas turbine uh, production? Fergus Ewing? If I said rain was wet, the Green Party wouldn't support me. Um, and they are not here. I, I do think that's it's a bit disappointing, but by hey ho, leave that to one side. What, what I think, in, in conclusion, of signing off, sir, just say is, is, is this: um, there's far too much partisanship in these debates, and it won't get us very far. Rationality, and rationality alone, is what is required. And to try, I think, to look at things with an open mind, to recognise that technologies have increased massively. The problems of the past will not be the problems of the future. Are we going to have too many wind farms, too much generating capacity from wind? There is a risk about that, and the profitability and economic benefits of wind are nowhere near matching oil and gas. I'm afraid that is a fact, no matter how successful it ever becomes. So in conclusion, listen to the experts. And in this debate about electricity supply, can we not have less heat and more light? Thank you, Mr Ewing. And I now call Craig Hoy. Mr Hoy. I uh, thank you, Deputy Presiding Officer. I'd like to thank uh, Douglas Lumsden for bringing forward this timely debate. It is timely because when it comes to energy, we are here in Scotland at an inflection point. Indeed, it is perhaps more accurately described as a tipping point. Are we, Minister, about to tip forwards to maintain and renew our nuclear future? or backwards into what could be an intensely vulnerable position in terms of our energy security? And if the answer to these questions is yes, then the SNP government must reconsider its approach to Scotland's nuclear future, because nuclear is a critical part of the journey to net zero. And that is why it is regrettable not to see Greens here this evening, because they talk about net zero, but neglect the fact that in many, many countries, nuclear is going to be a fundamental part of that journey. As the Declaration to Triple Nuclear Energy signed at the COP28 uh, summit underlines, nuclear will have that vital role to play in achieving global net zero targets by 2050. So regardless of what we do here, it will be other countries' nuclear capacity that helps us on that journey. And as John Kerry said at COP, the targets, the targets simply cannot be met uh, without it. There is, in effect, no net zero without uh, nuclear. In my own region, EDF has signalled its ambition, no more at this stage than an ambition, to extend the life of Torness Power Station. EDF says it's planning to extend the life of four uh, nuclear power stations in the UK, potentially, and increase in it investment in its nuclear uh, fleet, something that Scotland will lose out upon unless it reconsiders its position. Now, it will make the decision on whether or not to extend uh, the lifespan of those stations uh, with those that have uh, advanced gas-cooled reactors. I, I, I will, yeah. Minister? I think it's important to make the distinction the Scottish Government is very supportive of Torness extending the life of the existing plant. Precisely, and, and I welcome the Minister saying that. But if, in principle, you would like to see it extended, why not renewed? And that is a question that the SNP and the Greens will have to tease out if they are really committed to uh, net zero. Uh, those uh, stations obviously are torn S, Haitian 1 and 2 in Hartlepool, and a decision will be taken by the end of the year. But the Minister has preempted me. It is good to hear that she welcomes that. Now, that will require regulatory approval. But the question now here in Scotland is one fundamentally as to whether or not we want nuclear to be part of our journey to uh, nuclear security. In the words of Fergus Ewing, is the government's mind and its eyes and its ears now completely closed to the benefits that nuclear uh, brings. And let me just summarise those benefits. Torness opened in 1988, and EDF Energy confirms it is still one of its most productive nuclear power stations. And despite what the nuclear doomsayers uh, claim, it generates clean, safe power. And since it opened, Torness has produced nearly 280 terawatt hours of zero carbon electricity. To put that into context, that is enough electricity to power every single home in Scotland for 28 years. And losing that will be a critical loss to our energy capacity and security. And as Mr Whitfield says, it provides many stable, uh, high-skilled and high-paid jobs. And that pioneering apprenticeship programme that delivers for the local community and the local economy, but which will be lost, those skills will be lost to the Scottish economy. 
And today, Torness remains one of East Lothian's largest employers, with 500 staff, 250 uh, contractors, and a salary bill totalling £40 million per year, and much more through supply chain related jobs. And all of this, and I hate to say that all of this, and this is not a partisan point, is at risk because of what is now an illogical, dogmatic, and frankly, environmentally and economically illiterate approach to uh, nuclear energy in this country. Deputy Presiding Officer, as Mr Lumsden has made clear, the Scottish Conservative Party supports a nuclear fu future for Scotland, and extending the lifespan of those existing stations will help cut gas imports, cut carbon, and relieve winter pressures uh, on our grid. But that would be a short-term prize. The longer-term prize would be for Scotland to follow the rest of the UK, France and many other of those uh, European nations that the SNP extols the virtues of on a regular basis and look forward to a new fleet of nuclear stations here in Scotland. Frankly, what the SNP, the policy they're adopting at the moment, beggars belief, and Scotland will pay a heavy price if Scottish ministers don't think again on Scotland's nuclear future, because it is a fundamental part of our net zero ambition. Thank you, Mr Hoy. And I now call on uh, Julian Martin, Minister, to respond to the debate. Thank you very much, President Officer. Um, dis despite all the accusations of dog being dogmatic and ideological, it, we have a position in the Scottish Government, and everyone knows our position, is that we do not support the building of new nuclear power stations in Scotland under current technologies. Our main objection to it is that it is expensive. It creates toxic waste, and we don't believe that it's, not, it's needed for our future net zero energy system. But I do want to talk about Torness, and it has, Torness has been mentioned by a number of members, Martin Whitfield, Craig Hoy has obviously got an, an interest. I'd like to continue my point, and then I'll take you, Mr Kerr. We, I've, we recognise the contribution that Turness has uh, and uh, other nuclear generation plants, that historic ones, have made to Scotland's people and the call economy. And I, and I think it's important for me to mention to Mr Hoy that we are supportive of an extension to the generation and uh, operating lifespan of the, Scotland's last remaining nuclear uh, power station, Turness. If strict environmental and safety criteria continue to be met, I'm going to take Mr Kerr first. Liam Kerr. Uh, I'm very grateful. The, the Minister said that the main issue the Scottish Government has is the cost and the waste, but those exact points have been comprehensively yeah. debunked throughout this debate. So how does she sustain that objection to cost and waste? Minister. So Mr Kerr might think he has debunked the cost issue. I beg to differ, and in part of my speech I'm going to come on to, to, to that in particular. I mean, Jackie Dunbar was quite right in actually pointing out the difference in terms of like um, terrible air cost, etc. But also there's the cost of the actual building of them in the first place, which I will come on to. So nuclear power has historically played an important role in the electricity generation in Scotland. There's no doubt about that. But it, at the moment it accounts for only 16% of the total electricity generated in Scotland. Meanwhile, electricity generated from renewables accounts for about 71% in the same period. That's from last year's figures. In consumption terms, it equates to 113% of Scotland's gross electricity consumption being generated by renewables. Now, the reduction in electricity uh, generation uh, from nuclear power uh, plant in Scotland will be compensated to a great degree by the vast expansion of renewables and flexible technologies. And I want to mention, um, and, and thank you to Fergus Ewing for making this point, is that we're in a very fast-moving techno technological situation. There's existing technologies out there and emerging technologies, particularly um, in uh, wave and tidal, but also in battery storage. And, battery, and we also have existing technologies which have not had the support that nuclear has, like pumped hydro storage as well. We can't... I also, I'm, I'm not, I'm, I want to make some points here. We also... I want to come back to Mr Kerr's point. We can't ignore England's current experience uh, with the, 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 the nuclear developments that are taking place. New nuclear, nuclear power stations will take many more years than they actually predicted that they would. Decades to become operational. They push up energy bills before these projects even come online. And in 2013, well, I'll just not talk about the contract for a difference for 35 years for Hinkley Point C at 92 uh, 92.50 per megawatt hour, as mentioned uh, by, by Jackie Dunbar. Far higher than the strike prices set for offshore and onshore wind in the sixth allocation round. 
at uh, 73 and 64 pounds respectively now there's also no I'm, I'm going to carry on I, I, I also want I also want to mention that where nuclear has had a great deal of support from the UK government, there's other existing technologies with high capital expenditure costs, like pump sto hydro storage, which have not benefited from the, sa the same scale of direct investment by the UK government. I will. Does the Minister accept that you know, the, the UK's largest pump, pump storage station in Wales can only produce the same electricity as 7.5 hours to Ornest? Do you not see that that's completely inadequate? Minister. My point was about the fact that there has a great deal of investment been put into nuclear, almost like propping up nuclear, the nuclear sector in a way that the other sectors have been ignored effectively. And we, given the, the geography of Scotland, pumped hydro storage is a, 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 major, a major geographical advantage in that regard. Now, and Graham Simpson recognised its value in, in his, his speech as well. But just, you know, this, this nuclear gamble that the UK is taking right now, don't just take my word for it. The International Energy Agency published research that suggested that nuclear power in the UK would be more expensive than any other country. But yet the UK government continued to commit significant sums of public money. Um, Hinkley Point C, due to be completed by 2025, at a cost of £23.5 billion. That's what was said at the time. But taking in inflation into account, last month EDF estimated that the project may not be completed until 2031 at a cost of up to £46.5 billion. And I also want to thank Fergus Ewing for pointing that out. I've taken as many interventions as I think I can manage. Despite these delays and cost overruns, and indeed the price per megawatt hour, the UK government continues to stake taxpayer money on its nuclear gamble. Now, many times in Douglas Lumsden's speech and the other speech we talked about being anti-science, look at all the other countries who have decided not to go down the nuclear route. Are they anti-science too? Is Austria, is Denmark, is Ireland, is Italy, is Estonia, is Latvia, is Luxembourg, is Malta, is Portugal? No, I've taken as many interventions as I think I can manage. Um, Liam Kerr mentioned about the small, small modular reactors as well. Uh, presiding officer, I will battle on through the constant barrage of, uh, of chuntering there. Yet last, last week, the Environmental Audit Committee said that the government's approach lacks clarity on SMRs and it's unlikely to play a role in decarbonising the grid by 2035. And whilst SMRs are innovative, and listen, I am not you know, um, blind and deaf to innovations in any kind of sphere that can decarbonise the grid and could get us a more secure energy future. The thing is that they use the same method of electricity generation as traditional nuclear fission. They leave the same type of radioactive waste. I was really struck by what Liam Kerr said about £15 billion pounds been set aside to deal with nuclear waste. £15 billion pounds set aside to nuclear waste. What else could be done with £15 billion? Pounds? Could we be investing that in pump storage hydro? Could we be investing that in moving battery storage where it needs to be? I'll tell you, the one thing I've really noticed since taking this job is so many visits I've had in terms of battery storage is really coming on in terms of dealing with the intermittent nature of wind. I have already said I'm coming to, to, come to the end. We know that Scotland needs to deliver cleaner, greener energy. But new nuclear is not the answer. We're energy rich. As has been pointed out, um, members, as has been we've got pointed to let the out many times respond. by many members, we will have more electricity than we potentially can use domestically. We're nearly in that space already. Instead of wasting money on the wrong solutions, we are going to continue to support clean, clean green technologies which support energy security and a just transition to net zero, as well as putting much funding into the innovations that will be able to store that electricity. I thank Douglas Lumsden, however. We will disagree on this. And I can, I can see that Liam Kerr thought that I was going to make some kind of massive U-turn uh, based on his arguments they put forward. We do disagree on this, but the one thing I think that we all agree on is that it's a very fast-moving area of technology. We can't say never to any technology, but at the moment nuclear is far too expensive 
and I believe that the waste is still a very much a live issue. And for that reason, our position has not changed. Thank you, Minister. That concludes the debate, and I close this meeting.